When you think of the Canadian military, what often comes to mind? Well, to many Canadians, that would be peacekeeping and efforts to push for more demilitarized solutions across the world, in contrast to the blatantly obvious US warmongering. So Canada is actually using this to its advantage now. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is about to embark on nine days of overseas travel. He's going to Africa and then to Europe. And among the priorities is getting support for Canada, winning a seat on the United Nations Security Council. And there's a particular statement something that really really bothered me and the inspiration for what this video is going to become it was their statement on the international day of living together in peace where it emphasized its work for quote unquote conflict prevention stabilization and peace building initiative obviously canada is an imperialist nation more in the vein of the silent killer type while the u.s's aggressive bravado provides it with most of the attention in the international press. However, Canada was a crucial figure in the founding of the Lima Group, which came around with more than 10 countries together to plot a coup against Nicolas Maduro. But who else is part of the Lima Group? And why, frankly, should people care about this particular effort to overthrow Maduro. Well, let's have Telesur take it away. It may be mystifying why Canada would support a group like this. However, to put into context, there was a 2017 memo which was released in a Freedom of Information Act request, which showed that US cable, where they're bragging about Canada adopting an America first policy under Warhawk, Christian Freeland. Freeland actually held a secret meeting with Guaido two weeks before Guaido declared himself president. So in mid January, when Juan Guaido declared himself the legitimate president of Venezuela on January 23rd, of Asumir formalmente las competencias del Ejecutivo Nacional como el presidente encargado de Venezuela. Canada immediately supported this declaration. However, despite calls by Guaido for supporters to go on the streets and for foreign countries to essentially interfere and even potentially use military force to force Maduro out of office, his efforts came up in largely failure as the campaign to replace Maduro slowly lost power. Additionally, the opposition and the Lima group refused an offer from Maduro to hold an early election to certify the will of the people. Despite their struggles for support, Canada still continued to convene Lima Group meetings and publicly condemn the Maduro government, making false and slanderous claims throughout the entire process. It seemed to many that the US and Canada had simply accepted their failures and were set to leave the Latin American region alone for a long period of time. However, that turned out to be far from the case. Rather, the Organization of American States, known as an American puppet of sorts, was beginning to ramp up and would play a grand role in a coup against a leftist leader in Bolivia, the indigenous socialist Evo Morales. But why should you hate the group? Well, let's give Telesur a chance to explain this to you. OAS is supposed to represent the 35 countries of the Western Hemisphere in defense of peace, equality, and national sovereignty. This all sounds good, but the OAS has acted against these principles in defense of U.S. foreign policy in the region. After Cuba's socialist revolution, they kicked out the Caribbean island because of its ideology. Efforts were also made to kick Chile out of the OAS following the election of leftist President Salvador Allende. These 
efforts were dropped after Salvador Allende was removed in a bloody coup led by General Augusto Pinochet. He's also been able to wield its influence over organizations that are aligned to, but independent of, the OAS, such as the Inter-American Development Bank and the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. For years, the OAS has been targeting leftist governments in the region, especially Venezuela. OAS chief Luis Almagro has made no qualms about his connections and support for Venezuela's violent opposition. So much so that OAS member nations have reproached Almagro for acting like a politician and not a diplomat. In his 12 years in office, Morales had achieved tremendous success in improving the lives of the 99% of Bolivian society. And after receiving permission from the Bolivian Supreme Court, Morales decided to run for a fourth term against the U.S.-backed candidate. On October 22nd, Morales declared victory by a percentage of 47 to 36, narrowly avoiding a runoff election, ensuring that he would be the president of Bolivia for the next four years. However, that's where it all began to go wrong. The U.S. made a plea to the Organization of American States citing the findings of a politically biased and weaponized OAS electoral observation mission to the Bolivian elections, which made false and slanderous claims of election irregularities. They were referencing a poll which had no official legal standing in Bolivian law and which, even if it did have standing in Bolivian law, was shown to have no irregularities. Despite this, under U.S. pressure, the OAS began an audit of the Bolivian election on October 31st. Now, 10 days later, on November 10th, protests are continuing to rack up on the streets. The military has now betrayed the president and is now going on the streets protesting with the right-wing anti-democratic protesters and on November 10th the OAS electoral audit mission releases yet more slanderous claims of election interference and election irregularities. The next day Canada followed the US in condemning the Bolivian election. A day later Evo Morales announced his resignation slamming the Bolivian police force and the United States government calling his this a coup. Lo estoy renunciando justamente para que mis hermanas y hermanos dirigentes, autoridades del movimiento socialismo no sean hostigados, perseguidos, amenazados. Lamento mucho este golpe cívico y algún sector de la policía puede emplearse para atentar contra la democracia, contra la paz social, con violencia, con amedrentamiento, intimidar al pueblo boliviano. Those Movement of Socialism Party members were blocked from entering the parliament as Janine Añez, the Cristo fascist, was sworn in with less than the mandatory quorum becoming Bolivia's new president. Now she promised that there would be fair and free elections soon, those haven't happened. Over the next few months, violence ramped up against the country's indigenous population and leftist protesters. Meanwhile, Canadian mining companies profited as Anya's government signed new deals to allow these companies to exploit the country's massive lithium reserves. The U.S. was emboldened after the successful coup of, against Bolivia, and so they began to plan for an even more ambitious attempt, and that was to take over Venezuela and to launch an invasion led by Juan Guaido. In February and in April in particular, they began to plan with former Green Beret and Canadian military soldier Jonathan Goudreau, who is the leader of the Silver Corps uh, militia company. In Venezuela, I'm pleased to report that the multilateral effort to restore democracy is 
continuing to build momentum. I've asked my team to update our plans to reopen the U.S. Embassy in Caracas so that we are ready to go. As soon as Maduro steps aside, I am confident that we will raise that flag again in Caracas. And so in early May, they launched a coup attempt with around 60 Venezuelans and a few dozen members of the Silver Corps team. However, that coup attempt failed miserably. Eight Venezuelan members of the raiding team were killed, 13 were arrested, and two of the American veterans and Canadian veteran were caught as well. The day after, Maduro showcased their, their passports, confirming the identities, and soon after, the Grey Zone exposed that there was a $213 million contract. What did Canada do in this case? It followed its usual pattern, refused to criticize, and enabled the US in its warmongering imperialist aggression. Luckily, for the sake of Venezuelans, this failed. And even some of the Canadian media are now talking about disassociating from Guaido, which is quite something given their imperialist bent. And so, with Wyatt Guaido most likely permanently out of the picture in Venezuela, that is a moment to celebrate. There is far more to Canadian imperialism than just the recent two coup attempts that the Canadian government has actively supported. Canada has also followed the U.S. sanctions agenda line by line. Whether it's placing crippling sanctions on Venezuela, Nicaragua, and other socialist nations around the world, Canada is a full partner in the U.S. sanctions regime. The fact that Canada even has a chance in its U.N. Security Council race is frankly disgraceful as it is also opposed during Justin Trudeau's time as Prime Minister more than 50 UN resolutions advocating for Palestinian freedom and liberty. Canada is an imperialist nation at its very core. It is not a nation of peacekeepers, it is not a nation of peace, and it has an undue reputation which it has attempted to exploit consistently over the years. There's quite frankly not enough time in one video to go through all of Canada's imperialist history, even during the last decade. And so that will be left to future videos, which I assure you will come out eventually. Anyways, I want to thank you guys for watching this video. I really hope this was informative. Feel free to subscribe to the channel. Uh, definitely click on the notifications, give a like and go check out our social media pages and give them some support. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Hope you guys had a great day, and I will catch you later. Bye.